So my friends, I invite you to raise your hand if you've ever forgotten someone's name. Let's go to gallery view and take a look. Well, that looks pretty much like everybody. <laughs> That's a relief. Or if you've tried to remember something that you recently heard only to find that the details are just hard to locate in your mind. Anyone? Or how often have you heard someone say, oh, that name's completely gone out of my mind and I just can't remember things like I used to. Perhaps you've said it to yourself even. Or you might have said, oh, I think I'm having a senior moment. Anyone? <laughs> That's a lot of us. It seems like a lot of us wrestle with these memory lapses from time to time. And it's easy to feel frustrated and helpless as our memories fade and we can't recall a movie or a book or a story or an experience like we used to. But lest you get depressed or too hard on yourself, know that forgetting things is normal at all stages of life, even those younger here amongst us, I'm sure will have times when they forget things. In fact, the brain can only keep track of and remember so many experiences and learning at once. I sometimes wonder if our minds aren't a little bit like hard drives and they just get full or glitchy at times. Times of stress, such as during exams when we're younger and times of overwhelm and too much multitasking as we get older. Now, there are three major processes involved in memory. There is encoding, storage, and then retrieval. Encoding is the way that we form a memory by turning information into a usable shape. And then it must be stored for later use so that we can retrieve it at another time. Now, short-term or active memory allows us to remember things briefly in the present. It's the information or experiences that we're currently involved with. And paying attention to our senses in the present may help us turn a short-term memory into a long-term one. For example, if you're eating a meal, relishing the taste, the smell, or the texture of some food that you're eating can help you hold on to that memory for longer. Now, long-term memory may last weeks, months, years, or even a lifetime. Interestingly, as people lose their capacity for short-term memory, many actually retain their long-term memories intact. I remember my grandmother, Mary, being able to tell us vivid stories of her youth, even while her short-term memory was disappearing into the ravages of Alzheimer's. When our dear Francis Pardee suggested the topic of memory, I immediately remembered studying Marcel Proust in my high school French class in England. His detailed recollection of the taste and smell of a Madeleine pastry took his senses on a trip down memory lane. In his book, In Search of Lost Time, Proust famously said, remembrance of things past is not necessarily the remembrance of things as they were. He reminds us that our memories are subjective and color our life's experience. Memory is a mercurial, mysterious thing, and it isn't necessarily the objective truth of what happened. Our memories hold the stories of our lives and yet mysteries surround what we do and do not remember. In the book, You Are Not So Smart, David McCraney lists all the ways our attitudes, biases, and perspectives affect our memory. In parenting, for example, going to our child's soccer game, we'll experience the ups and downs of the game and feel the disappointments and excitement with our child. But if we're a taxi driver who brought some kids to the game, we may experience that same game with some boredom and disinterest. And then again, if we're the referee, we're going to see the game through a completely different lens of fairness and rule abiding and competition and so on. Same event, many different memories. It's the same way with anything we experience. We each approach it with our own filters, our own emotional reactions and biases, which accounts for why siblings can have completely different life experiences and memories in the same family. Memory isn't an objective reality. It's a subjective recounting of life influenced by the lenses through which we viewed it. 
Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about how the stories we tell shape our lives, but these stories are formed by the memories we have. According to Dr. Kevin Lehman and Randy Carlson in their book, Unlocking the Secrets of Your Childhood Memories, people remember only those events from early childhood that are consistent with their present view of themselves and the world around them. And they say that we block out those memories that don't fit. They call this the law of creative consistency. Creative consistency helps us balance and make sense of our earliest memories with who we are now. Like most psychologists, Lehman and Carlson say that our personalities are largely formed by the first five years of life. And they encourage us to call up early, early memories that we remember ourselves rather than the ones that we were told. And to flesh them out by asking ourselves, what did I feel? What did I see? We want to make sure these are our memories and not the stories we were told. Memories from earlier than age five are especially key and ideally no later than eight or nine. Memories become the jigsaw puzzle pieces that we assemble to create the picture of our lives. Yet as we get older or experience trauma, we may start losing some of the pieces of our puzzle. Like the memory balloons in our story earlier that one by one started to fly away from our minds, we may want to give others the chance to keep our memories for us, to hold onto our balloons so that we can pass them on to future generations. Now, Michael and I both loved the film, The Father, for which Anthony Hopkins won an Oscar. What's so engaging about it is that it shows how the same events are experienced completely differently by various family members, especially because the father has a totally different take on reality due to dementia ravaging his mind. This movie is an extraordinary brain teaser because after a while it's unclear what's real and what isn't. And since the events are seen through the eyes of all the different characters, each with varying memories of the same situations, we begin to question what actually happened. Is there even such a thing as a definitive memory? As the father descends deeper into dementia, we're left wondering whose account of reality is true. But we also get to experience being inside the brain of someone with dementia. We see how things seem very clear to them in their own version of reality, while everyone else seems crazy. One reviewer said that this film was scarier than any horror movie he's ever seen. I knew something was amiss at my stepsister's wedding when my father started putting pats of butter in his water glass at the rehearsal dinner. At first I thought he was cracking a joke because he was a humorous guy, but then I realized sadly that he was convinced that was where the butter went, quite seriously. And later that day he returned to his hotel room, but he couldn't locate the light switches. So he left his room and he started wandering aimlessly complaining that he'd forgotten to put light, that they had forgotten to put lights in his room. These were some of the first indications that something was wrong with this man who had been a very powerful intellect. Many doctors appointments later, my father was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. And sadly, things went swiftly downhill from there. It was hard to watch my father essentially disappear in front of our eyes. Physically, he was mostly strong until the end, but his mind slipped away over a period of several years to the point where we weren't even sure he recognized us anymore. <laughs> One upside though, was that on his 80th birthday, we surprised him with a party and he left the party for a few moments to go to the restroom. And when he came back, he was surprised all over again. But losing a loved one to a memory disorder is especially cruel, as some of you know too well. They seem like the same person on the outside, 
the essence of who they are is gone. So you're forced to grieve the loss of the person you knew and loved while they're still physically present. So what happens to our brains that causes such cognitive decline? There are over 5 million Americans now who have Alzheimer's disease and many more who suffer with dementia. And as the baby boomer population ages, this is projected to rise to epidemic proportions. So over our lifetime, there are many things that impact our brains and thereby our memory. And the science around memory loss and dementia warns us of specific stimuli to watch for. A distressed mind, depression, or grief can all influence your memory as they take a great deal of physical and emotional energy. Trauma or PTSD likewise can have a huge impact on our memory because you may have to juggle a range of cues and stimuli throughout life which reawaken distressing memories. Fatigue, sleep deprivation and sleep apnea all affect our brains as does our diet. And of course we know that concussions and head injuries sustained at any age can cause both short-term memory loss and make you more prone to developing dementia over the years. In addition, there are medications and surgeries which can cause brain fog, illnesses and infections from strokes, brain tumors, thyroid issues to gut, kidney or liver disorders, which can all cause memory loss and symptoms of dementia. And of course, there are hormonal shifts experienced during pregnancy and menopause and andropause, which can all have a big impact on memory and personality. As do too many distractions in life and multitasking, which can decrease the efficiency and processing capacity of our brains. And of course, there's just plain old normal aging. Just as our bodies are impacted by genetics, health and experiences throughout our lives, our brains too are affected. Cognitive decline is normal and common, but there are ways that we can help slow it down. And there's a lot of new research on this now that helps us understand more about our mind's longevity. One of the most important things for those suffering with dementia or Alzheimer's is to try and catch it early. Get preventative treatments happening as soon as possible. It's vital not to retreat or hide out of shame or hopelessness when you notice cognitive changes. Reach out to people. Although there's currently no cure, there is a lot we can do to help slow the progression. The famous singer Tony Bennett is a living example of that. He's been able to live and record music into his 90s, despite Alzheimer's because of the good care that he's receiving from loved ones, doctors, and the music he adores. At 94, though he's generally not able to be communicative, Tony is going on tour again this summer. He can recall all his old songs and lyrics with ease. He's most alive, happy, and present when he sings, and you can hardly tell he's got Alzheimer's. I invite you to stay to the very end of our service when we're gonna to have Tony Bennett singing Smile for our postlude, which he recorded last August at the age of 93. So what are some of the recommendations to stave off cognitive decline? Getting regular exercise, eating a healthy whole food diet, low in sugar and processed foods, as well as getting plenty of sleep are key foundational factors. Exercising improves blood flow to the brain and oxygenates it, which can slow memory loss. And keeping your brain active and challenged is also vital. It helps to review and talk about your experiences that you want to remember, or they can easily be forgotten. So you might want to write them in a journal or tell a friend a story of a moment that you treasure. We're also urged to jot things down because the actual act of writing with a pen and paper helps us implant the memory into the brain and serves as a reminder. 
I love my new habit of daily journaling on my iPad for that very reason. It helps me become mindful about what's special each day and what I'm grateful for. And now I'm adding a photograph of something meaningful that happened that day to quickly stimulate my memories as I scroll through. It actually helps to attach meaning to an experience by creating some kind of an association with it in your mind. For example, when you meet someone new, and I know how hard it is to remember names, by connecting them to someone you already know in your mind, you may be able to remember them better. Repetition also helps you encode a memory beyond the short term. Another great trick is to group experiences into categories, which make them easier to recall. And there are other short term memory tricks like mnemonic devices, like acronyms or visualization, adding images to the memory and self testing to help jog the memory. Dr. Michael Murray's newest book, The Longevity Matrix, gives us many insights into diet and supplementation for dealing with memory loss. Do ask your doctor and nutritionist about some of these ideas. I'm not saying they're the definitive answer. But Dr. Murray's research shows that when humans began increasing their intake of omega-3 fatty acids through fish, seafood, and marine algae, the increased EPA and DHA led to tremendous brain growth. Dr. Murray recommends boosting brain function, both by increasing blood flow through exercise, but also through super nutrition. Vitamin B levels are proven by Oxford University to be key supplementation for improving gray matter, as is taking EPA and DHA supplementation, which can apparently reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's by 40%. So if you have it in your genetics, this seems like an important thing to do. I'm also happy to say that having dark chocolate and raw cacao in your life is supposed to be great for your brain. And I am making the most of that recommendation. I tell you, <laughs> I see some of the others of you too. And then of course there's eating leafy green vegetables and celery and apples and blueberries, which are also said to help boost brain health and stave off cognitive decline. And if you want more details on that and other supplementation ideas, I suggest you get his book. And at the end of my sermon, we're going to post all of these resources so that you can look them up easily. The adage of use it or lose it seems to really hold true for your brain. So maintaining social connections, managing stress, and performing challenging activities like doing crossword puzzles, for example, all help. In addition, healthy behaviors such as not smoking and eating lots of fruits and vegetables and maintaining a healthy weight and having only a low amount of alcohol all protect your mind. Additionally, I invite you to undertake creative endeavors and learn something new like digital photography or a new language or playing an instrument or painting. It's important to regularly introduce new mental stimulation and change things up to keep your brain lively. You might even consider teaching yourself to write with your non-dominant hand or even learn to eat with it. Socializing, which engages multiple areas of the brain is also vital to keeping our brains healthy. This is one of the reasons why this past year has been so challenging for our mental well-being. Isolation is a problem. I'm grateful that we've been able to gather like this through Zoom, but as more and more of us get vaccinated, it's gonna be such a joy to gather again and be socially connected in person. Socialization, family and community attention are vital to slow the progression of dementia related illness. So coming to Chalice is actually good for you in a whole new way. Now don't forget to add variety to your spiritual practices too. Variety is important, so try different forms of meditation or prayer or Lexio Divina or yoga or even chanting. Mindfulness meditation is proven to engage new neural pathways and mental flexibility. It helps thicken the hippocampus in our brain, the part of the brain that's responsible for learning and memory. And it can also help improve attention and focus as well as empathy and even immunity. And it's said to stave off cognitive decline. 
Now, I know that I often share the benefits of meditation with you, but it has so many positive effects on our lives that I think it can't be overemphasized. And since I'm doing the meditation teacher training next year, I'm going to be teaching a special meditation class, intro to meditation, specifically for Chalice. So what about brain training games and apps on your phone and websites? Do they help? Well, some studies suggest, yes, they do, but if you're already on your computer too much, then probably going outside and moving or socializing or enjoying a new hobby would actually serve you better. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, in his latest book, Keep Sharp at Any Age, shares his five pillars of keeping your memory sharp. And they are move, discover, relax, nourish, and connect. Sounds like a great recipe for living, doesn't it? You might want to read his book that Francis recommended if you're interested in knowing more about it. When I worked as a hospice chaplain, one of the most fascinating things was to see how important music was to most people. Immanuel Kant called music the quickening art. He felt it stimulated and tightened your brain connections. So if you want to help someone come to life and connect, playing some of their favorite music is often a way to reach them. I also learned that to help people transition peacefully, playing impressionistic, non-specific music is best so that they don't stay attached. In all cases, music seems to be a comfort and helps soothe weary minds. I would always bring my reverie harp with me to play for people in the last stages of life and to sing with others. And it never failed to calm and support people in distress. In fact, research is showing that people's favorite music can reawaken lives lost to dementia. The extraordinary touching documentary, Alive Inside, shows how music connects people with who they are and who they've been all their lives that they come alive inside when they hear the right music. Since music is inseparable from emotion, it helps recall memories that come with it. And in the film, we see a 90 year old man by the name of Henry, who was unresponsive, listless and slumped in his chair for two years. And when someone puts his favorite music on an iPod and gives him headphones, he perks up after two years and sits up in his wheelchair for the first time, his eyes open wide and he starts singing along with great gusto. And the extraordinary thing is that when they remove the music, he's still present and able to hold a conversation about his favorite songs. And he starts singing Cab Calloway tunes and he even remembers stories about his daughter whom he had forgotten. The music helps him remember who he is and come to life again. It's because the parts of the brain that recognize music aren't affected in the same way by dementia. Music reawakens the brain and with it all the memories that accompany it. As one of the gerontologist doctors shares in the film, most medicine dims the spark or light in people. Music, on the other hand, brings engagement and lights the spark within. And the film introduces us to a few dedicated people working on getting music to all residents of nursing homes nationwide to help improve people's quality of life. So my beloveds, what's the playlist of your life? I invite you to start thinking about and collecting the music that you love. If nothing else, it's gonna bring you joy reminiscing and it might help you sustain your brain. My playlist is definitely gonna include Memory from Cats, which I sang earlier, as well as some Mozart and Beethoven, Bernstein, Barbara Streisand and Stephen Sondheim among many others. And of course, there's going to be dance music too, lots of it. My beloveds, may you be inspired to care for your body and mind as your sacred library of memories. May you relish your life's memories and intentionally be present for new ones. 
in addition to photographs and stories of your life, may you find the playlist of your life. The poet Percy Shelley said, music, when soft voices die, vibrates in the memory. May it be so. Amen.